All right, so let's try and record. Great. Well, welcome everybody this morning. We have about 16 to 18 people signed up, and generally speaking, a lot of people watch the video later. So we have a small group today, which <coughs> takes more questions and more um, time for questions. So just checking in with everybody. Um, I noticed myself this morning just to say that as they keep reporting about the virus, um, it keeps getting sadder. <laughs> I don't know how everybody else is feeling, but the reality, hi, huh, Kathleen. The reality of so many different people um, suffering from so many different ways. Hi, Bill. Um, Hi. You know, this is no longer considered just a respiratory um, disease or acute respiratory syndrome. There are many other ways that people are now dying and suffering from. So um, it feels particularly solemn at the moment. But uh, anybody want to chime in a little bit with uh, just a little anything personal they want to just share for a moment before I get started with the slide presentation and the rest of the talk? Yeah, I might not be able to be here for the whole thing. However. Okay. Sure. Uh, in and out, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. And if you're not, you know, we're going to mute everybody. So if you're not speak, if you want to speak, you have to raise your hands and then unmute yourself. So otherwise, there's too bad, too much background noise. So Bill, I'm going to mute you, and Peggy, I'm going to mute you as well. And uh, Katie, hi, Katie. Hi. And Clyde Ray, I'm going to mute you. You get yourself muted. All right, great. So here's everybody. I think we're pretty, we're pretty good to go. So um, anything, any, any, any moments of something to say? Otherwise, um, I'm going to get started with the presentation as it is. All right, uh, I'm going to share my screen here. So uh, there'll be slides. All right, so you all see that coronavirus forum? You all see that there? Great, so this is what we're So really, this is even more important now in terms of not necessarily what I'm teaching you. Some of the things that I'm teaching you may help you in sort of keeping your lung, I mean, they would help you in keeping your lungs healthy. They may be useful in warding off a more deeper um, symptoms from the virus. I can't say that for sure. Um, and now that the virus is attacking other places or moving into other locations in the body other than the lungs, um, it still is the imperative that breathing is our first line of nourishment, the first line of having to be able to sustain ourselves. So my, my, my theory, of course, is that the healthier the breathing is, the more, the stronger your immune system and your body's ability to be able to um, deal with what comes along. So that's why this is about how do we stay safe with ourselves. And so um, it's important to note that um, I'm teaching you breathing, breathing for strength, resilience, and recovery and health. And I'm not a doctor. I'm a breathing educator and a movement educator. So um, these are my educational skills that I'm passing along to you, not medical advice. Okay, just to be clear about that. So I wanted to talk a little bit first about susceptibility. So one of the things that we're seeing, and this is a particular um, viewpoint that I have, and the reason I put up air pollution first um, is because um, and the 9 million people die a year that we know about from air pollution. Um, and we'll see that slide in a little while, but I might mention it now. Out of those 9 million people, because 95% of the world's population, 91 to 91.5% of the world's population does not have clean air to breathe, according to the World Health Organization. That's a huge statistic. And so air pollution itself is a cofactor in and why we get sick in that uh, we've been breathing, you know, in or originally when people were, the old elderly were first getting sick, some of the pink, articles that came out were, yeah, because they've been breathing dirty air for the longest amount of time, so their lungs are the most debilitated from air pollution. And so it's a majority of people on the planet are already having a compromised immune system due to the fact that they've been breathing air pollution for so long. Uh, and like I said, 9 million people a year are already dying from air pollution. 72% of those die from heart attack and stroke. And that's actually what we're seeing with the virus now, that the people who are in 30 and 40 and 50 are having strokes. They're, they're hypothesizing that the lungs for the younger people are much stronger than for older people. So the virus is going to the brain instead. It goes to the, 
in where it's going to the kidneys and the liver, it's going to the places, and this is a breathing principle from Pateko, is that when you're under oxygenated and the body's not receiving the need, the nourishment that it needs for oxygen, usually it's the weakest organ in the body that suffers first. And so that's why with air pollution, 18% um, die from lung compromise, and half of that is from asthma and COPD, and the other half is from lung cancer but 72% die from heart attack and stroke. And so that's what we're beginning to see now, a lot more of the virus attacking people with uh, getting people, giving people strokes and heart attacks. And so the, de the detrimental and downside of air pollution is using your mouth for breathing, which we'll spend a lot of time doing that because that means you're taking the pollutions right into your mouth. So our environmental conditions have been unsafe for us for a while, water, soil, in the air has been, is now up to consciousness of being unsafe for us. Obesity too, a lot larger the percentage of the people who die uh, and had got the virus in much more um, critical terms were obese. And that has a lot to do, I think, in terms of my perspective from it, um, as a lack of movement of diaphragm. You know, the obesity does not allow breathing to be uh, as healthy as it can be and a lot of shortness of breath there. Uh, high blood pressure, diabetes, coronary disease, and pulmonary compromise. And from my perspective, also anxiety, stress, fear, and panic, somebody who lives in those things most of the time is going to have it is a cofactor. It's a debilitating um, effect on, on the breathing mechanism to be in anxiety, fear. And when that happens, um, immune systems become overactive and become compromised. So and that was discovered in 1930s by Hans Seeley, who talked about uh, distress causing uh, general adapt adaptation syndrome, which is a failure of, of the organ body. And so this virus is a stress for us and is causing organ failure. Um, we're seeing it in, in a lot of blood clots. We're seeing now that maybe they, the, what I thought was pneumonia in the beginning, maybe high altitude sickness, similar to high altitude sickness, but a lot of blood clots is what they're seeing now. And Doctors are actually, um, there was a report the other day of a doctor taking a blood clot out of somebody's young, young person's brain because they had a stroke and they removed the blood clot. And he was amazed to watch while he was in the brain, watching the body make those clots, just continually to make them. So we don't know what's happening. We don't know what this virus is really. Um, so from my perspective and breathing, you know, we want to have a healthy attitude through breathing. We don't want to be frightened by our breathing, which is really easy to do when you get sick from breathing. But it's important to re recognize that it is a sacred gift, that it is our life force, that no two breaths are alike, that each breath we breathe is another cycle of life. We don't know if we're going to get another breath after the one we just breathed, which is more evident now than ever. And so it's really a demands to be honored and treasured and treated gender, tenderly and with a lot of grace. It's my attitude. It's an ally. It can really help us stay healthy. Um, and it means there's no harm really in its general nature. And we have behaviors around breathing. Some of the behaviors really function well for us and some don't. So we have to take a look at the behaviors, see what, how they, how they, um, serve us or don't and then really look to changing the behaviors and we'll talk a little bit more about that and as you know we see a lot in the media breathing can help self-regulation of the autonomic nervous system so that we can come use our breath to come out of anxiety and fear so anytime you have a question about anything just raise your hand we'll unmute you and uh, answer your question so please so here's this here's the statistic 91 percent of the world's population i just heard it was up to 95 but really, anyway, and we only know about 9 million people, just like we don't know about the virus. People die at home for other reasons that we have no, that don't go to the hospital. So then it's not really, um, it's the statistic is not as accurate because we don't know. And they may not look at somebody with pancreatic cancer to see if air pollution was the cause. Um, but um, the University of Wisconsin did a study on microplastics and 90% of the tumors they dissected had plastic in them. So we just really don't know who's dying from what right at the moment, but the air pollution is a pandemic, which obviously we're getting to see the difference because the view from India right now in places of India, it's the first time they've been able to see the Himalayas in 30 years. So the, the, the intelligence of the vi virus, if you will, has shown us what happens to our world if we stop the way we've been living in it because we need to have clean air to breathe and get it sustainable. 
just a little my own particular politic. Um, so it's really interesting about deep breathing and I wanted to talk a little bit about deep breathing because I want to speak to it from because deep breathing um, the way people normally do deep breathing is taking a big breath in and then blowing it out and really in the long run that is not healthy for our respiratory gases it unbalances our respiratory gases it's a it's a, a misunderstanding about breathing and breathing out through the mouth but on the other hand, so I wanted to talk about breathing, learning how to breathe from deep within. And so taking the breath from inside and opening up to let the body fill with air. And um, it's important right now, the doctors are using um, deep, deep breathing to recruit parts of the lungs that are not, haven't been used. So if somebody comes in and they're not used to using their full capacity, they're finding if they can give them some breathing exercises to get a fuller capacity and, and recruit the lungs, the part of the lungs that are not sick with the virus, then they can, it can speed their recovery. And so though some of you may have seen the doctors online teaching people how to take a deep breath, hold it for five seconds, let it go, and then cough. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and how to actually take a deeper breath from within so you can really expand your lungs to full capacity uh, in an easy way to do that and we'll show you how to do that so the things that are really important are nose breathing uh, it must be nose breathing you breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose and you pace your life so you can always use your nose for breathing for many reasons which we'll go over you need a good posture for ease of movement of breath body and the diaphragm we're going to go over the tongue at the roof of the mouth, which helps open the airways and creates less airway resistance and breathing with the forces of gravity to support our breathing for the downward pull of support of gravity and the upward lift into buoyancy and full breathing. And so we'll reduce some airway resistance with a technique and, and breathing from deep within to fill our capacity. So, um, we really know have really need to know the spectrum of how we can make our breath really tiny and be really small in our breath for our health. And so to reduce some of our anxiety and breathe gently with ourselves, as well as going to the other end of the spectrum where we can take a really, really full breath, fill our lungs to capacity and let that exhale come out really easily. So as a way of keeping and stretching the lungs and keeping them working if we feel ill in our lungs. So three things that are really essential about nose breathing is you breathe through your mouth as often as you eat through your nose. It's a silly little thing to say, but it does help you remember that. You pace your activity level so you can continue to breathe through your nose, including exercise, and especially when you're outside right now. Somebody's been in your atmosphere and has aerosolized their breath through a sneezing or coughing. It can stay in the air for a longer period of time than even if it can last in the surface. So you have to be careful when you're out, which is why I think they're wearing, why they recommended masks, because you don't know the air field that you may just be walking through where somebody else walked through and sneezed. So having the mask on while you're outside can be a useful thing, but you have to really know how to breathe inside of a mask, which we can talk about too. So here's a picture of a couple of Oh, it's not here right now. Maybe I'll come back to it. So, so the major benefits of the nose breathing. This is a this is a picture of a man's nose and lungs. This is a live picture, and you can see that there is these three openings here. This these bones that look like little curlicues in the nose. And what that does is it spirals the air through the body. So breathing is not a linear phenomenon. It creates movement, moves our body in a rocking kind of way when we breathe if we allow ourselves to be moved by breath so it's important to recognize the spiral dynamics there are many advantages to the spiral in terms of spending more time in the nasal passages and in the sinuses to pick up humidity regulate body air temperature to filter and to produce the chemicals that are, are antibacterial and antiviral so we want to use the benefits of the design of the nose to really allow the full um, conditioning of the air so that our lungs are receiving the kind of air that really facilitates health. So the nose is the guardian of the lungs. That's how I express it. And it has the ability to filter down to 0.5 microns, which is really small. Human hair is 50 microns. 
unfortunately, the virus is smaller. It's 0.125 in size, and smoke is smaller than five microns either. And so the nose it does not is not able to filter it, um, but it does. It can um, warn, be an early warning system that something is entering into the body that needs to be attended to by our immune system. It regulates the temperature of the air to the lungs, but the lungs only like body temperature air, otherwise they go into reaction to anything that's too cold or too warm. It has a particular humidity it likes, and so the mucous membranes can absorb moisture or add moisture to the air if needed. It produces antibacterial molecules to kill bacteria that may be trying to enter the body, and it regulates the gas exchange of carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen with the outside atmosphere, and it produces nitric oxide, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but nitric oxide is a vaso and bronchial dilator that's only produced through nasal breathing, and um, in 2006, they did a study about the production of nitric oxide and its effect on the SARS virus. And they found that the nitric oxide that was being produced in the nose had an antiviral effect on that virus. And they did studies in 2006. So we don't know if it's going to do the same thing with the coronavirus, but we give ourselves the best chance to optimize our health by using our nose for breathing. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that too. To, maybe produce some antibacterial, antiviral, um, vi antiviral molecules to help uh, stop the virus. Um, so give it, going through the nose, like I said earlier, gives the body a chance to innovate a response by presenting the invader to the defenses before it enters the lung. It's just a personal opinion, but I've seen articles that are speaking about the same thing. So. So in exercising, I just wanted to show these pictures. Here's a gold medal winner on the left, picking up a gold medal in a relay after running a quarter mile. She's one of the fastest women in the world at 440 meters or a quarter mile. And I have many pictures of her and she doesn't open her mouth and she's the fastest woman in the world. She learns how to do what I'm teaching. And it's been many years doing that. And I'd rather be the woman on the left than the woman on the right. I don't know about you, but uh, <laughs> the other one's stressing and mouth breathing. And the other one's a swimmer who's got a tremendous capacity to be able to swim and nose breathe at the same time. So it can be done. And most people who try it and get to it in about three or four days. So what we want to avoid is hyperventilating, which means breathing faster than the body uh, is meant to be breathing at any particular time. You know, a lot of you know about hyperventilating. Somebody's going to faint when they hyperventilate. Uh, gets dizzy, maybe pass out when they hyperventilate, and they come with a paper bag and they breathe back their own CO2 and they come back alive because hyperventilating um, dissipates the levels of CO2 below normal in the human body. CO2 is not a waste gas. It's a hormone in our body that regulates the distribution of oxygen. So when CO2 levels are given, too much is given out from hyperventilating, then oxygen distribution slows down, and the first place it slows down is into the brain, and that's why people faint, and that's why when they breathe into a paper bag, they breathe back their own CO2, oxygen starts to flow again. So Dr. Bateko coined a term called hidden hyperventilation, where it doesn't look like somebody's panting, but your mouth breathing, it's an increase of the usual breathing rate. You're breathing more than 12 or 15 breaths per minute. You're using your chest for breathing, you're shallow breathing or holding your breath, you're gasping for breath, and you're frequently, frequent yawning and yeah, sighing, frequent yawn, sighing, and belching. I forgot the ING on both of those words. So you're just gonna watch those habits of those are things that you do normally and recognize them as a kind of dysregulated breathing pattern when you're doing those things. So, and they are, the reason Dr. Bateko coined them as hidden is because a regular doctor wouldn't, wouldn't notice them. They only notice when you're panting, but they're, they accumulate over time to debilitate the respiratory gases and the breathing uh, health in the body. So this was discovered in 1885 and then again in 1904. <coughs> And you will get a copy of these slides. So if I go too fast and you'll catch them, you'll be able to look at them again. Um, and so what I just said was um, the proper levels of carbon dioxide facilitate the delivery of oxygen to the cells. And that is the primary re receiver of the nutrient of oxygen to make the energy that makes our body run. 
So anytime that the delivery of oxygen is depleted to our cells, we have less energy. And when we have less energy, that is a repercussion into our immune system. We cannot mount the defenses that we need to take care of ourselves. So we need to be optimally oxygenated, which means to be breathing in a way that does not dissipate our CO2, which mostly means using our nose for breathing and not our mouth. Um, so, so mouth, so another thing that's really important here, especially now is reducing the, um, anxiety and fear response. And um, I'm gonna try this for ourselves right now to see how when we use our mouth for breathing, we trigger the autonomic nervous system to be in, imbalanced and to trigger a sense of fight and flight that there's a threat in the space. And that threat then gets interpreted as, as anxiety. Um, and nose breathing balances the autonomic nervous system to tell us that the system is okay, it self-regulates, there's no threat in response, we can relax, we can digest, we can be easy in ourselves. So the easiest way to know this for yourself is to put a hand on your chest and one below your bottom of the rib basket and um, above your belly button. And just when you're breathing in and out through your nose right now, just notice the effort of breathing, kind of your inner state, your nervous system inner state, and kind of measure it on the level of relaxation to anxiety. Relaxation would be up at 10. Uh, anxiety would be down at zero. And um, we, whether you're using your chest for breathing or whether you're, you know, which hand opens first when you breathe in and out? Is it your, bottom, your lower hand or your top? And then when you feel like you have a good um, sense of that, go ahead and try a couple of breaths through your mouth. Watch what, watch what moves first, notice the effort, and then notice what happens in your nervous system. Then, then go back to nose breathing, and then you can, you know, back and forth until you get a really good sense of that. And when you have a good sense, then just open your eyes back up and I can know it's time to move on. But take your time till you really get a feel for that. All right, I'm gonna, I am gonna move on, Patricia, just hang with what you're doing. So most people report, you can nod your head, yes or no. Most people report that breathing moves to the chest when you're mouth breathing. And that's actually, you know, if you were threatened and you were running away from a, from a, a real threat, you would open your mouth to breathe and move into your chest because you could move air faster there. There are bigger alveoli there. So that's appropriate but only if you're actually running from something or fighting for something. And that the nervous system gets escalated. It's a little more active. Um, and that it would also be a useful thing to mobilize your energy in fight or flight. But during a regular day when you're not really running away from anything and you start to use your mouth for breathing, those sensations of, oh my God, something's in the field of threat and I'm mobilizing, I'm feeling anxious, that can produce that kind of anxiety. And so you want to be really careful. So I notice in my own body, if I'm walking and I start to feel anxious, I have to pay attention. Oh, am I using my nose for breathing? And immediately I move back into my diaphragm and um, that anxiety dissipates. In the old days, before I knew much about this, I would, all those thoughts would come up. I'd figure I'd have to figure something out. But once I drop back into a self-regulation, there's nothing really to figure out. I'm just relaxed in my body. So. Just be aware of that. Yeah, any thoughts about that or questions? 
Okay, good. I'm moving along, there's got a lot to cover today. So this has come up quite a bit, and I wanna just kind of speak to it a little bit. Um, shortness of breath. And so I just wanna to speak to shortness of breath is actually, there's nothing, when breathing, be, breathing behaves in certain ways, and usually it is an indication of something. And shortness of breath is what a lot of people are experiencing with COVID. And, you know, in looking into what's going on that they're short of breath, do they need more oxygen? Usually not when they're short of breath. Usually what it means is there's a carbon dioxide buildup. Because carbon dioxide in too great a much, a greater amount, is a poison and causes one to feel suffocated. And so when they feel suffocated by too much carbon dioxide buildup, then you go to shortness of breath to try to breathe much more quickly and shallowly to dump that carbon dioxide. So what they're finding in the medical profession is that the body is accumulating carbon dioxide, that when it is affecting the lungs, that people are having a hard time getting rid of that extra carbon dioxide. For a while, they were thinking it was a good thing because it was delivering more oxygen. And in some cases that was true, but it does cause that shortness of breath and the lung capacity also is being decreased at the same time. So people are having a hard time. Um, and um, this is a fascinating thing. This is every day, there's new information. There's a veterinarian wrote a long article about he, what he sees is the symptoms of how people, why people are dying the way they're dying and some of the symptoms they're having is similar to what he sees in his animal practice when they are poisoned by carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide would be the kind of thing that would happen if you were sitting in your car and the engine was running and all the fumes were coming in, all of that is carbon monoxide. And carbon monoxide has an affinity for the hemoglobin which carries oxygen. And so it would displace the oxygen in your blood and you wouldn't have any oxygen and you would die. So he's saying that what he's seeing COVID patients who are dying are similar to the way animals die when they have co carbon monoxide poisoning. So he is hypothesizing that the virus is causing the body, which makes its own carbon monoxide in small quantities, to trigger a carbon monoxide buildup in the system. And so that's why people are just all of a sudden walking down the street and just dying. They're just dying from, from no oxygen. So it's just an interesting thought. So that would also be shortness of breath to try to dump those, um, those um, molecules of carbon monoxide. And this term came across to today, my screen, emotional inflammation. Yes, Janice. Hi, yeah. My question is, um, how is the controlled breath when you like shortness of breath versus breathing in, holding, and then feeling that air hunger? So, Mike, yeah. you know, it's like what's happening with the CO two in post in that particular in that particular case. If this is that exercise is for anxiety, which generally means you're over breathing, which means you're giving off too much carbon dioxide. So if you're not sick and you're doing that exercise, it's just to build back the reserve of carbon dioxide that you've dissipated from uh, overbreathing and causing anxiety. Whether or not it's effective when you have COVID, it's just depending what happens inside of you. I'm not sure that that would be the most effective way to do that. Okay. So, uh, you know, we're emotionally inflamed right now, most of us, I would think, you know, and grief, anger, and despair are really high on, high on my list of feelings that are going on right now. And especially the first one, that is, you know, in Chinese medicine, that is where we hold our grief is in the lungs. So, um, you know, we need more, we need more um, universal grieving. I think we're all in a unity of grieving. So when we are short of breath, breath is signaling an underlying cause and it's trying to regain the balance in breathing by breathing fast to get that extra buildup out of the way. So taking it seriously and not trying at that particular moment to make breath quieter, but maybe taking the bigger breath at that particular moment, which is what they're doing in the hospitals, to take in more breath and then the longer exhale, which really can help dissipate some of that CO2. So we'll try that. Um, this should, um, so we did that already. It's in the wrong position. But so a couple of things that really facilitate our ease in breathing. All right. Um, one is posture. So have you, some of you heard, you can just shake your head. 
the, the word proning these days. Have you heard proning, some of you? So proning, so it's interesting. Proning is just in anatomical uh, language, there's a supine position, which means facing upward, and proning means lying face down. And so um, Dr. Bateko always said that the breathing capacity can be increased uh, when you lie flat on your, on, your, on your stomach because you're compressing the lungs so that you don't overbreathe and expand them too much in the front and you move the breathing to the back of the body which is there is more lung in the back than there is in the front. So what they found is that people who come in who are having difficulty breathing that as soon as they put them on their stomach that difficulty goes away. So they had a really uh, an exceptional case of a man who came in with a saturation level of oxygen in their blood, which normally should be between 95 and 98. And he came in with a saturation level of 40. Which <gasps> was very, yes, right. Why he was alive, I don't even know. They put him on his stomach and in a minute he was back to 95. <gasps> right. So um, if you're having trouble breathing and shorter breath, get on your stomach immediately if you can tolerate it. All right. Definitely not on your back. You on your back, you lose 40% of your lung function immediately. Um, and that two reasons for that is, uh, one is that you're compressing the back of the lungs where there's more space back there. And the other is that you are uh, moving all your viscera below the diaphragm, your stomach, your liver, your intestines are moving towards your diaphragm when you're lying flat down. When you put your knees up, it moves down towards the pelvis, which I'll show you a picture of. So don't sleep on your back ever anyway. It reduces your lung function. Side sleeping while you, on your, when you're resting and sleeping, and um, sleeping on the stomach record, re, supports recruitment of the lung tissue in the back of the body. And so I have some article here when you get this, if you wanted to follow this link on proning and a, and a regimen of how often to do it and how to, how to go about doing that for recovery. Um, this is the horse rider position. So in the elevated position, in the sitting up position, you want to be this way, if you can, when you're working with breathing and trying to maximize the effectiveness of your breath. Because if you, in most chairs, well, you know, when you sit back, your spine is heading towards <laughs> somewhere back here. So you generally bring your head forward a little bit, which can get uncomfortable. But basically what that does is takes your lungs and compresses them into your belly, and then it limits the movement of your diaphragm. So you don't want that. So you want yourself to be sort of on the edge of the chair, not using your thighs, having your feet flat on the floor, so that you are in, a, in alignment, that you put your spine in an alignment that is supportive to carrying the lungs in a healthy way because the lungs are hanging off the spine. And if you're lying down, then this is the way to help reduce the, um, the effect of the viscera up into the diaphragm to put your knees up. And if you have to sleep on your back for some reason, then at least put your knees over a pillow or two so that you get them off of being flat. Okay. So another thing that's really important in terms of opening up the airways and giving yourself the optimum chance is to have the tongue at the roof of the mouth with the lips slightly closed, very lightly touching each other with the lips, with the teeth, almost touching a few millimeters apart. If you haven't, you've been used to doing this, it's kind of hard. It takes some practice and oral facial myofunction therapy is a good one to teach people how to do that. Um, it completely opens the airway. So here's what I'm talking about. So you get a picture. This pink thing here is one's tongue, right? And this is the hard palate, which the hard palate is both the floor of the nose and the roof of the mouth. And so you can see the tongue is not just, and it's, it's not right behind the front teeth. You know, you have those ridges behind your teeth. The tongue is resting behind at the first ridge and then curling itself back into the palate, not just pointing upwards, but curling. And the important piece here to look at is the size of this airway space. Yes, it's a drawing, but when you put the tongue down, here's the roof of the mouth here, and the tongue is down, the airway space gets smaller. So I see some of you trying that. It's worth trying to see if you, and if you want to feel what the tongue feels like in the back towards your teeth, you want to say the word ACK, A-C-K, ACK. 
and you can feel the tongue right raise up in the back. And so it's not forceful. You're just letting it sit there and rest. If it feels forceful to you, then you can, you know, and you're not used to it, then you need some myofunctional therapy to help you reduce the tensions in your neck from doing that. But just try putting your tongue up there and breathing through your nose and watching what it feels like. And then drop your tongue down and notice if it feels like the airway gets a little bit more occluded. Some of you notice that? Is that happening for some of you? Yeah, mm -hmm. you can notice a difference there. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, Katie? Is that what happens? Uh, is, is some of this happen with uh, sleep apnea? What you're describing? Yes, very much so. That's why sleeping on the back is also, especially for when you're older, um, because the tongue will drop back into the throat, the jaw drops back, and so that is obstructive sleep apnea. That's why, um, besides sleep apnea machines, some people go to um, dental bite plates where it holds the teeth uh, together and so the jaw doesn't fall backwards. But it really is um, important to know how, there's a really wonderful book called Jaws. It was just written about the pandemic of, of orthodontia and malocclusion that is being seen in elder people now as sleep apnea. That when they had uh, bad bites or uh, orthodontia work, really rearranged their mouth and now so the long-term repercussion has been sleep apnea. Um, but, and they, you know, the recommendation of course is to practice keeping your tongue there for four to eight hours a day, but not always easy if you haven't kept it there for most of your life, but worth paying attention to. In, you know, in spiritual practices and in continuum, it's a, it's a, it, it helps, I, I find this too, if my tongue is down I don't really feel as connected to myself, like in the circuit of my energy. And I put my tongue up there and I sort of get, feel like I'm immediately hooked in. I'm connected and I feel like I'm hooked into my place of belonging right here. But when I drop my tongue down, I sort of get a little uh, disconnected. Yeah. And who is the author of The Jaws? Can't give you that right now. Okay. Thank you for the reference. Yeah, it's a great little book. Um, that's where these pictures come from. Um, so if your nose gets, gets uh, this is an important thing to do if you're not even with COVID, but you're just having a cold and you want to make sure that you continue to be able to feed your body properly with breath, is the nose clearing exercise. Right? And so I'll demonstrate this for you. So just to get into the rhythm of this, you breathe in once and lift your head up a little bit. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out, and then with clean hands, you pinch your nose and you bob your head till you feel a slight urge to breathe, a very slight urge to breathe, and you keep your mouth closed, and you breathe as if you're smelling a rose, very, very gently. And, then, and you do it as many times as you need to. So if you want to try it now, go ahead and do that. Just get, breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out, pinch your nose, and bob your head if your neck can tolerate it. If it's not, just stamp your feet. And then breathe in gently like you're smelling a rose, so gently. It's sending a signal that you're taking care, that you're reducing the flow of air, that it's that breathing is safe and so the tissues can can instantly absorb um, the mucus that may be in the way. If it needs to be repeated, repeat it as often until you get clear. If it bothers your neck, like I said, stamp your feet or walk while you're doing it. Even any of those things will work because they're producing a little bit more carbon dioxide from the movement. And so it helps to create a vaso and bronchial dilation. So it dilates the airways. Question. Yes, Sheila. Um, so you open your mouth to breathe out or you... No. First, in, in anything I teach you, any of the breath holes are always after the exhale. So you breathe in, breathe out, pinch your nose, keep your mouth closed. And then breathe in. No mouth breathing. Okay, is that, is that clear, Sheila? 
Well, it says down here at the bottom of the screen, it says breathe out as your head goes forward. Yeah, in, out. That's to warm up. Oh. And then if after the second run, you do this. That's just to get into the rhythm of moving your head. Oh, okay. You don't have to do that. I don't do that particularly. I just breathe in, breathe out, and then just bob. Mm -hmm. But some people are not as coordinated, so I want them to get coordinated into the movement. So it's just a little bit more of the instruction. Keep your mouth closed, Katie. See, it's an interesting thing that we change which nostril is dominant every 20 to 90 minutes. Sometimes we breathe through the right, sometimes we breathe through the left more dominantly. So it's a little deceiving to think our noses are stuffed. If we maybe stuff more on one side, open more on the other, that particular moment, because it's tuning some electricity in our, in our brain by how we use our nose, which nostrils being used. So just to be aware, it's not always, it's the forcefulness of trying to breathe in like that that causes the nose to come together and feel like it's stuffed, but with a gentle inhale, air can move more clearly through. Okay. Good exercise. All right, so I'm trying to practice this a little bit. I don't wanna give away my um, carbon dioxide and I don't wanna actually escalate my anxiety or my any nervousness that may be present. So talking while breathing awareness to reduce mouth breathing means that when if I pace myself so I can breathe through my nose all the time, when I feel like I run out of air when I'm talking, I close my mouth and breathe back through my nose. And then I continue to talk until I feel like I run out of air. And I breathe back through my nose. And I really like it because I'm tracking the movement of my of the air through my body and my body's response. So my awareness is landing on my experience when I'm breathing in. And then when I talk to you, I'm more in my experience awareness of being engaged in a conversation with you. So I'm bouncing back and forth between attending to me and attending to the conversation. And it also keeps me out of what do I say next? What do I say next? What do I say next? While I'm breathing back and paying attention, what I need to say next just arrives without a whole lot of forethought. It's a good practice. Shakespeare wrote all his original manuscripts with breath pauses. And so reading aloud with periods and commas is a good way to practice that. I find it much more calming to, do, to speak that way. Especially, you know, this is especially true. We especially teach this to asthmatics because once they start to use their mouth for breathing, it just makes them totally frightened by breath. And so we're really wanting them to harvest their health of their breath this way. It slows everything way down. So I wanted to show these pictures of the lungs so you could see the size of them. Sometimes people are amazed about how big the lungs are. They are, um, his, this person's arms are up. But even so, the lungs are above the clavicles. They're up here, almost to, to the neck, right in the above the clavicles. And in the front, they go all the way down to the bottom of the front of your ribs. And if you follow your ribs around the back, you'll see they slope towards the back. And so the lungs are increasing inside toward the back. And so this is an anatomical drawing of the back of the lungs. And this is the space that the lungs can fill into when they're fully inflated. And this is where any impingement of the diaphragm will not allow that to happen or any shallow breathing or breath holding doesn't open it here. So in the hospitals, what they've been doing is trying to get people to breathe with more capacity so they can open these lungs back into this space here to use more of their lung that has not been damaged and get more breathing capacity. And we'll play with that in a minute, but there's a lot of extra space that these lungs can open into. And inside of these, this lung are 300 million air sacs, the size of a tennis court, if you cut them open. And so we have a lot of airspace to move, you know, a lot of surface area to move air. So we're going to practice this piece here, so along with the tongue. This is another piece that um, 
is really useful. It's learning how to allow the body to breathe you instead of your idea about how much is needed and putting a lot of effort into taking an, an inhale and an exhale. So I just want to notice what kind of effort you do in breathing and then think. This is a way to, this is a very silent breath. This is a thinking breath because when you think it, you will hear it. And so on the inhale, you want to think the syllable sa, and you can draw it out to make it a really long sa in your thinking. And all the time that you're thinking, your lungs will be filling with air. And then when you breathe out, you want to think ha as you breathe out with no effort in breathing out, letting the lungs themselves can use their elasticity and the diaphragm coming up to squeeze the air out. So just see how this works for you. Thinking about sa, and just noticing how really it feels like the air is being pulled through your nose, and the lungs are expanding without as much restriction. If you were to try to take a big breath by breathing in, you'd kind of feel yourself tighten up in your chest, which is the an antithetical to wanting the lungs to expand, and they can't expand while you're tightening because you're putting effort in. But if you let the effort from your own breathing out and not use it, and just let the lungs open up, you'll find they open up a lot easier. So just try that. Some of you already are doing that. Peggy. So if you find that if you find that that's true that there's an is it, the inhalation is coming easier as a way of exercising the lungs like the doctors in England have been urging people who have COVID see if you can really elongate that sa and keep filling and filling and filling and filling until you feel like you're just the balloon is about to burst. And then let that long exhale ensue afterwards. And see if you can feel like you're getting a little bit more of an expansion. And that's where your breath follows awareness. So just be aware of the back of your body and the lower part of your lungs in the back as you breathe in. Letting the stomach be soft so the diaphragm can descend. and then letting the lungs do the work of exhaling. So it should feel like, like, wow, I'm using some of my lungs that I've never used before, and that I'm not aware of using on normal circumstances. And that's what the doctors are after, the people who are suffering. Yeah, Sheila? Um, it makes me feel a little lightheaded. Mm-hmm. So just be careful when you're exhaling, Sheila, just to let the air out on its own. And just do it slowly. Don't do too many breaths in a row. So one breath should take 10 or 15 seconds. One total breath, inhale and exhale. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Then if it feels too lightheaded, go back to regular breathing. Usually lightheaded comes from breathing too fast or too much, too much forceful exhale. And then just go back to a smaller amount of just doing saha and a small breath. Keep it small. But I'm just trying to show you the variety because you can use saha to, to minimize the breathing. To just feel yourself relax into a small inhale. And then you can go the other spectrum where you can use it to really blow your lungs way up. And that's why we want to have the capacity to be able to move. So if you were to go to the doctor and they say, come on, fill your lungs up. Let's see you fill your lungs up you'd be able to do that because you've practiced being able to open them and expand them. Mostly, normally, we're breathing two seconds in and three seconds out. It's one breath every five seconds, which is about 12 breaths per minute. In yoga, they, they, yoga, they like four to six breaths per minute, which can happen when you, especially when you're exhaling. I'll get to you in a minute, Patricia. When you're exhaling, 
you know, you're letting your body just soften and some of the tension's coming out. So when you breathe back in, hopefully you don't gather up that tension again, but you're breathing without that tension that got released in the exhale. Patricia. Yeah, I, I would like to share an observation. Um, it was um, about thinking the sound. I know yeah. what you mean, um, but I was observing if I go to thinking, then the sound goes along the midridge of the nose up more in the forehead. And it's not so expanding. It's, it's going into the mind, sort of. So then I was um, uh, searching for another image to support the idea of expansion, which you were explaining. And I said, like, if uh, instead of imagining the vocal, um, as expressing the sound as now when I speak, uh, I move the the vocals into this area and let the airway speak the sound. And, and there is no it, there is there is no vocalization of the sound. Yeah, yeah, it it's just an image. Yeah, so oh, that's great. So let me just say this: this interesting thing you went to. Most of the time, people have breathing habits. These three holes, the one here in this picture here, the lower hole, the middle hole, and the upper hole, they have an impact into the nervous system. At the level of the lower hole is the instinctual brain. It's the brain stem. It triggers the, um, the response in the brain stem, which is instinctual. The middle hole triggers the limbic system, which is your emotional brain and your heart. The upper hole is your bliss point or your thinking brain, right? So most of us have a habit. So, you know, I, I use this example when somebody gets really angry, right? And just they're on fire. What do they, what do their nostrils look like? They're really spread, you know, wide. And so they're taking all that air into their instinctual brain to power their anger and their, their response in that particular moment. When we do saw on the way in and you let the lungs be pulling the air through, it pulls it through the entire vestibule of the nose. So it touches each one of those holes to bring in an alignment of your heart, your gut, and your brain. That's my experience of it. When I let the inhale be long enough and it makes me feel like I've got all my capacities on board in those three things. You like that, Rebecca? Mm -hmm. Um, and so well, I'm just, uh, the, the thing that's really important for me, Patricia, and I appreciate you for the question, is I, with my tongue in my, up at the roof of my mouth when I do that, I'm letting all of this rest on my tongue. So the lungs are just, their lungs are in complete receptivity, and the longer I do it, the longer that the lungs just keep opening up. But thanks for, I think so, I'm glad you found a way to make it work for you. Mm -hmm. Great. So what happens over time with this and is that once you get a sense of, wow, look how it switches me from me doing all the breathing to letting my body do the breathing and how much more gentle it is in my nervous system, I don't really have to say sa and ha anymore. It's an automatic. My body does it automatically. So it's worth practicing. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so that's just the instructions. So here's something that's really interesting that's also been discovered uh, after SARS and, um, and also for stuffiness, is that humming, mm, humming increases the production of nitric oxide. 20 minutes of humming produces, increases the production up to 15 times. Well, like I said earlier, nitric oxide in previous trials has been shown to be antiviral. And so there's an article that you can link into with your time. So worthwhile humming and humming looks like this. So you have to be really careful with humming because the same idea prevails about um, breathing um, to my capacity, you know, um, with, um, let me do it this way. So I'm already ahead of myself here. But, mm, so let's say I hum for a few seconds, 20 seconds or less. When I stop humming, I immediately don't grasp for air, but then go back to 
a quiet breath and then come again, just like speaking. So I take the time to refill my lungs from humming, which have probably used some of the residual air and then go back to humming again. So not hum, grab for another breath, hum, grab for another breath, but really take the time in between the hums to fill my lungs again before I can hum again. So they did, they did a study with them, with the one study I read with somebody who had chronic stuffy nose. It was a male in this case, practiced humming for an hour before going to bed, had no nighttime stuffiness, and in four days of humming for an hour before going to bed, no longer had it ever again. So, but I'm more interested in it for the production of nitric oxide, particularly at this particular time. So a little practice, if you want to do a little humming practice, a couple of times a day, maybe three times a day. Take a walk, hum, hum your favorite song, but just hum away. Okay. Um, this is not a COVID stop breath talk come, um, exercise because I understand that, you know, it's unrelenting, the dry cough, and probably not under your control. But if you had a cough where you feel a tickle in your throat, not to exacerbate the cough by coming up into your chest to breathe, but really basically going, making sure you're taking small breaths in and out of your nose. Hold your breath for a few seconds. Breathe in and out slowly. Keep your hands over your mouth, tell yourself you're not to cough, and try to take normal breaths through your nose. Just not succumb to the tickle if you can. See, the thing with coughing is it's a lot of up energy. And so you can get caught in chest breathing from coughing too much. And then once you're caught in chest breathing, if you have a cold, or some flu, you're going to have a harder time recovering when you're only using your chest for breathing and don't even realize it after a while. See, these exercises help you kind of remember to slow your breathing down and come back to more diaphragmatic breathing than chest breathing. So this is a mini pause, and this is similar to what we just did. It's, um, it's really useful if you feel like, yeah, Elena. Oh, uh, you're muted, Helena. Hold on one second. Let me unmute you if I can. No, you better unmute yourself. Okay, I'm unmuted. So I have a cough. Mm -hmm. And so you put your hand over your mouth. Yeah, clean hands. And uh -huh. then you breathe in. So the, and then when the, do you hold your breath? On the breathe, after you breathe in or when you breathe out? Always in anything I'm teaching, it's always after you breathe out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So this is a great mini, this is a great exercise. If you're feeling any, any throat soreness at any time or a stuffy nose, this is a really simple exercise. You breathe in, you breathe out, and you count to five and hold your breath, suspend your breathing. So you use it after coughing, sneezing, yawning, or sighing because those are up energies. And they also are a big release of carbon dioxide. So holding your breath for five seconds, three to five seconds, rebuilds that carbon dioxide that you gave away from coughing or sneezing. And it brings you back to diaphragmatic breathing. If you have a stuffy nose in the middle of the night, you can do this for 10 to 15 minutes before going to sleep, maybe one every 30 seconds. But if you're getting sick, at the bottom here, it talks about doing 100 of them in an hour and maybe three times. Because these are, this is a real immune booster, especially if you feel like you're getting sick in terms of you harvesting your CO2, staying quiet in yourself, letting that CO2 help that oxygen delivery to your cells, producing the energy you need to combat any illness that's trying to invade your body. So a couple of ways that people in the past have done this is use 100 toothpicks. I see you, Rebecca. Put 100 on one side and do them and do move a toothpick each time. I particularly like doing one every three breaths. In an hour, I get 100 of them in. I don't like counting. Rebecca, you have a question? Yeah. Uh, what is it that, um, why does the 
the three to five seconds of pause, why does it have all these wonderful effects? Because it's increasing your CO2 level. And that CO2 level after those things that are say there are dissipations of CO2. But if you have nighttime stuffiness, the CO2 is going to act as a bronchial, a CO, a bronchial and vasodilator. And so it's going to open up, uh, open up the membranes to help absorb the mucus. Quiets the system down. It's an amazing thing if you've ever, never had it happen through a nose clearing exercises or just generally doing things like this, to have a complete stuffy nose and in the next breath, have your nose absorb every bit of mucus that was in it and dissipate the stuffiness. It can be that quick that that can happen because the cells in the nose, the epithelial tissues have what are called goblet cells and goblet cells are what produce the mucus and they have the ability to secrete and to absorb. Given the right moment and atmosphere in a nose clearing exercise or this exercise, it sends a signal to those goblet cells, oh, we don't need to protect the nose anymore. The nose is quieting down. <laughs> pulls it right out and you go back to quiet breathing. If you're mouth breathing or overusing your nose, it secretes the mucus to protect. Protect from invaders, protect from too much volume, too fast into the lungs. All right, got two questions that, you know, Janice and then, uh, I don't know, I think, was it you, Sheila, that raised your hand? Go ahead, Janice. Okay, my question is how to do this. I think what it's saying is breathe in, breathe out, Pause, let's say, pause five seconds. Mm -hmm. Then breathe in, breathe out. Mm -hmm. Then pause again. Just no, if you were going to do 100 of them an hour, you'd breathe in, you'd breathe out, hold for three to five seconds, take two normal breaths in and out, then do the next one. Okay, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you were going to use it for um, trying to prevent an illness. I had a woman on in one of the first programs that I offered. And she said, I taught her this in early 2000s, and she's been using it every time she feels sick. And since like 2003, she's never gotten sick. Every time she starts to feel a sore throat, she'd do this exercise, and it would disappear. Because basically, remember what we're doing, breathing, when it's healthy and regulated, strengthens the immune system. If breathing is dysregulated and putting the body in a, in a, in a compromised place, it feels threatened. And when the immune system feels threatened, it overreacts and it starts to destroy healthy tissue. And when it destroys healthy tissue, it makes more debris. And so, especially with COVID, you don't want the immune system overreacting because it's already making debris and to add more debris is what's clogging up the lungs. At least that's in my reading. So we're trying to settle the immune system down and constantly trying to give the body the best oxygenation it can get. And it does that because CO2 levels are in balance and facilitate the delivery of the oxygen from the blood to the cells to make the energy the body needs. Because remember, if the, if the body is under oxygenated, that's a starvation at the cellular level. And at the cellular level starvation, that is the worst stress the human body can be under. So it makes all other stresses much more difficult to manage. So at the most, we want our body to be nourished at the level of the cellular level with the maximum amount of oxygen. Because when it doesn't, then it has to produce energy without the use of oxygen, which it can do. It creates a lot of lactic acid buildup and turns the body too acidic. So we want to keep our cells fully oxygenated. So most of the time, our lungs work fine and the oxygen delivery to the blood is full, but it's getting it off the blood into the cells that we're after here. And CO2 helps balance the pH of the blood, which facilitates the optimal delivery of oxygen from the blood to the cells. And CO2 can help do that if we're just, if we overbreathed or hyperventilated, again, back to the paper bag, it's a, such a perfect example when somebody is getting up on stage or over talking and they're, so frightened, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And all of a sudden I get really lightheaded. Why? Is because the oxygen stops flowing to the brain. And then they breathe in the paper bag, they breathe back their own CO2, oxygen starts flowing and that dizzy spell goes away. All right. 
So here's a good thing to do. Oh my God, time just flies. Here's a good thing to do is to break habits of breathing is to, um, is to make a list. When do I notice I use my mouth for breathing? You're not gonna change a habit of mouth breathing until you know when you do it and under what circumstances you do it. Common places, shower, eating, driving a car, watching television, talking. So make a list for yourself and just kind of notice and you go, oh, I'm about to do that event where I normally mouth breathe. I don't have to do that right now. I mouth breathe, when I started making this list, I noticed two things. One was when I went to the mailbox, I always mouth breathe. And I always was anxious going to the mailbox. And then uh, the weirdest thing was I would drive fine with my mouth closed, but as soon as I opened the door, I would mouth breathe. So I had to break that habit too. So this is a good idea. Okay, so you wanna practice quiet breathing for 60 minutes a day if you can, uh, just to keep your att attention and your awareness and learn the difference between, you know, how you stay quiet in yourself and when you're over breathing at other times so that you can make that correction. You want to expand your ability to breathe quietly and also to fill your lungs to capacity. And if you sleep and if you're at night and you breathe through your mouth at night, well, then you're, you're breathing in anxiety all night long. So the thing that says taping is this is paper tape. And you tear off a piece and you make sure right away you bend over a part that's not sticky. You want a piece that's not sticky. And with clean hands, you take a little bit of that sticky off. And you can wear it in one of three ways. You can train yourself this way with a smaller piece of tape. You can put one this way with another one this way. Or you can... If you need to, in the middle of the night, unconsciously, because there may be too much CO2 buildup that you're not used to, you will take it off and find it in your hair or find it wrapped around your fingers in the morning or in the sheets. But remember when you take it off, really gently, because it's gonna be stickier in the morning, or use your tongue to push it off because you don't wanna tear your lips. So you can buy this at CVS or Walgreens, just buy the brand names, not the off-brand names like CVS or Walgreens, because you want the good glue on there, which is hypoallergenic. This is 3M. This is micropore tape. And so uh, I get them on Amazon for 39 cents a roll. In the store, they're $5 a roll. Okay. Um, so... Um, Present moment awareness is central is a central experience experiences via the senses. So this is an exercise I picked up, which I really like. It's so simple, and somebody used for anxiety. It's a five four three two one exercise to alleviate anxiety. And what you're basically doing is when you're walking along, is you're noticing five different visual experiences. So you're using the sense of your vision, four different sounds, listening for four different sounds. Three touches, whether you're self-touch or breath touch from the inside or touched by the wind. Um, two smells and one taste. And you've activated all five senses. And so like, oh, wow, I'm in my sensing world, not in my worry world. It's kind of cool, I think. I like it. And for those who practice continuum, I like it for making a transition from deep within to coming back to the surface to make those three observations go, oh, I'm back in present moment reality. Okay, uh, this is a hyperventilation exercise for asthma and anxiety. This is a good one. This is the one you've been practicing, Janice, and finding uh, good results with for your anxiety. And so this is the same principle that Rebecca asked the question about why does this work is because you're using this when you've been over breathing. Like I said, you're anxious and you've been over breathing. And so what you're basically doing is creating little breath holdings to increase your oxygenation. Now, you wouldn't probably use this if you have COVID because you've already maybe got too much CO2. But on a, regular, on a regular basis, if you're feeling well, this is just a good breathing exercise to have as a tool in your skill kit. And so it's real simple. And I teach this one because this one can, you can do for yourself. Just You don't even need to stopwatch. You can just count in your mind one, one thousand, two, one thousand. 
But if you were to see somebody else having a difficult time, you could take them through this because they can't think for themselves. And you could just say, hey, follow my directions and, um, and you'll feel better. So the, I'm getting my stopwatch because I'm going to do this with you. Um, so if you only have anxiety, you would do it up to the count of six and then you'd go back from the count of six because you're only trying to relax the nervous system. If you're having asthma attack and don't have your inhaler with you, you're not only trying to relax your nervous system, but you're also trying to open the airways. And so the increasing of the CO2 levels here with longer breath holds have the ability to pop that airway open again and, and bring you back from an asthma attack. I've used this many times as an asthmatic to, without an inhaler to open my airways so I can vouch for its effectiveness. So just to get a feel for it, right now everybody's pretty quiet in their breathing, so this may feel too fast for you. Don't worry about it, just do it anyway, if you will, and um, let's just see what happens, okay? So I'm gonna, the directions will be breathe in, breathe out, and suspend. And it takes 81 seconds to do this first one, and I have pulled people out of severe panic attacks just with this one exercise. Are you ready? All right, take a breath in, out and suspend. One, two, breathe in, breathe out and suspend. One, two, three, breathe in, breathe out and suspend. One, two, three, four, breathe in, breathe out, suspend. One, two, three, four, five. Breathe in, breathe out, suspend. One, two, three, four, five, six. Breathe in, breathe out, suspend. One, two, three, four, five. Breathe in, breathe out, suspend. One, two, three, four. Breathe in, breathe out, suspend. One, two, three. Breathe in, breathe out, suspend. One, two. Breathe in, breathe out. Okay, how was that? Okay. Yeah, good. All right. Here's another one. This is from Dr. Breath, Carl Stow. I don't know if some of you know Carl Stow. He's dead now. He was a choir sing, a choir director um, in New York City, and he was known for finding people off the street who never sang in their life, teaching them how to breathe properly, then teaching them how to sing, and then doing concerts with amateurs in Carnegie Hall. So he was quite, quite, quite the man. And he also um, worked with the Olympic uh, Committee in track in 1968. And, um, his and also worked a lot with um, World War II veterans who came out of the army with emphysema from contamination in ships from asbestos and things like that. And so he was, he was also a massage therapist. So he was very intent on relaxing the body through massage. But this is the way he was the first, one of the first people to do videos, uh, internal video x-rays of the diaphragm. And what he found was that for people with emphysema, the diaphragm had holes in it. It was very weakened. And so his idea was, if I'm going to make these people have to rehabilitate, I have to strengthen their diaphragm. That's the most important thing I can do. So um, for continuing people, you could probably do the who breath. But here is the way that this really worked well. Really very simple to see your capacity. And this is a good one also for opening up the lungs. And it's real simple. It goes like this. Take a breath in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then my lungs really open because I've given off a lot of um, exhale. 
and then I breathe easily for a while. So this is an exercise to strengthen the diaphragm. So Rebecca, how many did you get to? I, you're, you're muted, so I can't hear you. One less than you. One less than me. Okay, good. Right. Uh, Robert, would you do this? You wouldn't do this aloud. You just did it aloud for our benefit. The counting. Is that right? I like to do it loud. I always do it yeah. loud. Oh, okay. Yeah, I always do. Yeah. Okay. Because it is an exhale. And so, you know, what the, what the recoil is, Allison, is after I've exhaled so much, the lungs just open. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then I go back to quiet breathing again so that I can reharvest any... Um, any CO2 that I might have given off just for, you know, I wouldn't do them right in a row. I would, you know, return. Because when I, mostly when we breathe in and out, we just use the air that's needed to breathe in and out. Very small amount, really. Like, to those who've had children, you know, or cats and dogs, you see them lying on the floor. They're so relaxed that their breathing is so small, you don't even know if you're breathing, right? Um, but when we do something like this or sing or something like this, we use a lot of the residual air in our lungs. We can never empty our lungs. We just use residual. So when the next breath in and out, we're replacing some of that residual air. So when we feel normalized again and we feel like, okay, we're breathing in a normal way again, and then we can do the next, then we can do the next round of it. Okay. Because otherwise we'll still, if we do up too much of the residual air and we don't replace it, we'll start gasping, <sighs> trying to grab more air. So we want to reestablish our balance and then do it again. Thank you. There it is. Um, excuse me a second. Somehow I just am missing a slide. So let's do this together in this little bit of time we have left. This is so most of the time, if we find ourselves over breathing, we want to slow ourselves down. These are a couple of ways to instantly, instantly regain our composure around breathing. Everybody dislikes being told breathe because the first thing that happens is people go into oh am i doing it right am i doing it wrong am i doing it right am i doing it wrong that is the worst conversation you can have in your head about breathing because you're in you're in question you're in judgment you're in confusion well guess what the breath is going to do it's not going to be able to move in all that chaos so we want to stay out of any right or wrong so we first thing that i like to do and this is a three-part piece is when, with sa and ha, just notice the movement of my body in relationship to the movement of breath. I'm following movement. Movement is a biological function. It is the primary, along with oxygen, the most important piece of breathing is the nourishment we get from being moved by our own breathing. Just like a sapling in, in the forest needs the wind to grow strength, we need our breathing to move us for health and strength. And the other piece that's really important here that really helps us open up our breathing to more ease is then we're exhaling, we're losing some buoyancy, which means the density of our body is getting more dense. And we feel the weight of ourselves more. And that weight is descending in the exhale to whatever we're sitting or standing on. And so when we feel ourselves come down to the support of our chair or the floor, can we rest there? And then keep that awareness of being grounded with the earth and take our inhale with the awareness of support and move into the buoyancy and the, and the recognition of the spaciousness of us when we're buoyant. So we're watching movement in the saha and we're watching how we move to gravity. And every time we feel like we, oh yeah, I just released some tension to rest in the support of what's underneath me. Just notice that the next ex inhale is going to be easier. It's a root law of gravity. It has a downward pull and an upward lift, right, Patricia? And so the exhale is in aligning with the downward pull. 
And once we've really established our place in the in our gravity, the upward lift is just the next next part of the cycle. And so it moves us towards being with the breath, being the breath, being nothing else but a moving, breathing body. And opening up the flow. Because receiving support of the earth and the support of the space when we're buoyant is something we all need is support. So it's accessible. And our breathing can take us there. And if we do this for a while, five or 10 minutes, we're not gonna do that long here, you'll start to notice when you receive support, we're stacked creatures. So in other words, you know, our shoulders rest on our lungs, you know, our lungs rest on our diaphragm and so on and so forth, up and down. So we start to notice as we receive support, it's like, oh, I don't need to hold my shoulders that tight or, wow, well, my eyes can soften. But it almost becomes a body's intelligence showing you, oh, I can relax this piece now. And when you do this over and over again for yourself, you start to notice it's always the same places that let go. And you go, oh, these are my tension patterns. These are how I take tension on in my body. And so you get pretty smart about that and are able to move from tension to relaxation pretty quickly, maybe within one breath. So this is my favorite meditation. And I do this frequently throughout the day. And sometimes I just do it in one breath when I feel like, oh, I've just gotten myself tense. Where's gravity? Oh, okay. Soften. There I am on the ground. Keeping my connection and my awareness. Breath follows awareness. And then I'm easier in myself. Is that working for some of you? Great. Okay. So practice that on your own. That's why I say practice it 60 minutes a day, five minutes at a time. So you really understand the difference between being tense and not being tense. <laughs> okay. So a couple of things real quickly is uh, this is a Batego practice when you're feeling like a little breathless or not feeling well, uh, a headache or a flu to drink a quarter a teaspoon to a half a teaspoon of sea salt, probably Himalayan salt right now because sea salt is pretty contaminated, non-iodized. Drink it as a medicine two or three times a day. It's really useful. It's got a lot of minerals, and that's what's helping balance the body. So it works. I'm surprised how well it works. The other is uh, wash your nose. You know, we're talking about washing our hands. <laughs> wash your nose. Uh, you know, that's the filter. You want to keep that filter clean. So neti pot or just put some water under your hands and you know, in certain places, like in the South, they had some problems with neti pot because there was bacteria in the water and people were getting bacteria in their brain from doing a neti pot. So if you feel any apprehension about that, just get some distilled water, sterilized water, or boil some and use that water instead. So for COVID, you know, there, uh, this, this should be part of your home kit. Is it a pulse oximeter? And there's an article there how to use it, as well as a thermometer. Because what it tells you is your blood saturation. So if you see your blood saturation dropping below the 90s, 92, 90, 80, you're in trouble. You need to get to a doctor. Along with if your breath uh, breathing rate increases up into the 20 to 30, 30 breaths per minute, that's shortness of breath and low oxygen levels. Good sign. That's when you want to go to the doctor. Don't no confusion about it to the hospital. Um, the last little part of this is smoke, virus, and other pollutants. This has become a real issue, um, this mask business. Now, these masks, N95s, are the most effective because they're sealed all the way around, so nothing can get in and out. Bandanas, you know, stuff can get in, though they do prevent. But the thing about masks is, that you, is, the, is the phenomenon of our body's habit is to know there's 
look where the air is. It's everywhere. So we, we're breathing from the field, right? So we, we don't have any, that's our, that's our habit. Once you put this on, there's no field. Breath is in here. So you have to kind of treat it like, where am I breathing from? So I have to really recognize that when I have to take my nose breathing, I'm breathing from the air that's in the mask. So it has to be more gentle and quieter. And when you exhale, it gets hot. And what do you think is getting trapped in here is carbon dioxide. So you have to be careful to not breathe so fast that you're breathing back so much carbon dioxide that that's going to feel difficult to you and suffocating. So you have to let your exhales really, you know, complete themselves with a little bit of pause so the CO2 dissipates so you can breathe back. And breathing is more difficult through a mask. So you have to watch your, rest, you have to watch your heart rate and, and, the, and the intensity of your heart because if it's hard to breathe, your heart rate's going to increase and your pulses are going to go up. So you have to be real moderate. It's not like you can do your normal exercises when you're wearing a mask. Things have to be moderated a little bit to accommodate the breathing. Google just designed a mask. I don't know if you, some of you have been reading that. They, they opened up a nonprofit with a couple other country, co companies and raised $2 million in a week to turn a snorkel mask into one of these by putting filters in them. Um, and so everybody can get one that way. You know, snorkel masks are not abundant there, and they're manufacturing them with the filters. So I wrote them and I said, are you considering what it's supposed to be like to breathe in there? And luckily enough, they wrote me back. And they said, yes, we have been. Uh, and we did test it. And no, it doesn't, their masks do not raise heart rate, but it does raise the CO2 level slightly. So you have to be careful because CO2 levels uh, over normal, normal is 40, 400 parts per million. And if it gets up to 1,000, it's a 15% decrease in your cognitive function. If it gets up to 2,000, it, it's a 21% decrease in cognitive function. And if you sleep in a bedroom with the window closed, one person, it will go up to 1,000 to 2,000. If you sleep with two people in a bedroom with the windows closed, it will, and by the morning, it will be 2,000 um, parts per million, and you will feel groggy in the morning because of too high levels of CO2. So I have, um, I have one of these, a monitor in my house. These are two different monitors. Uh, to measure both the quality of the air in the house and the CO2 levels in, in the room. And so when they get out of balance, I open a window or do what needs to be done. The problem when it's smoke is you can't open a window, so you have to have a circulatory system in your house. And so that's where filters come in. You need to, I think, I personally think everybody should have one or two filters in their, in their home. Uh, and it should have charcoal in it for smoke. Now, the question, question arose, um, will filters, HEPA filters, kill the virus and trap the virus? So I went online, and this is the um, reference to the article you can read. It says, mostly because they're droplets, but if you put the filter on high and run it at full speed, and the filter is measured for, it's a CAD, C-A-D, can't think of what it stands for right now, but there's a rating for, for how many square feet in the room and the CAD rating. The CAD rating is optimal for the size of the room and you run it on high, it's circulating enough air fast enough that you will pull you know, pollutants out and possibly some of the water droplets that are in the air will be pulled towards the filter and get filtered in the HEPA filter because the HEPA filter is small enough to filter those viruses. So I think everybody should have filters in their house given the conditions of the environment right now. We have clean air right now. But when everybody goes back to work and with the reduction in pollution controls in the United States, thank you for the present government reducing all the air pollution controls around the country. Um, we're going to see an increase in air pollution in this country like we've never seen before, like, like in foreign, like in Delhi. And that may be not as bad, but Delhi is the worst air in the world, along with uh, Wuhan. And that's what we've seen with the virus. The virus has been worse in the places that have the highest air pollution. So. Um, it does debilitate us. So I think everybody should have a filter and a clean room. You can read about a clean room is a room you can go to if there is an outside environment that is unbreathable, that you have a room that in your house that you can actually trust will deliver the clean air that you need. We, it's important to us up here in the Northwest because we have a lot of fires up here and the air becomes really unbreathable up here.
So just to quickly end, there's some other things here from Stephen Porges on social distancing and how to stay connected, uh, even though it's social distancing. And I have some other references here along on, in, under here, 28 Reasons to Nose Breathe and some videos that I think are helpful for exercises, Qigong exercises, some things that I've done. And I do have private sessions and do work with pe people privately. And some of those sessions can now be covered on insurance if you go through um, holistic orthopedics. Um, so we're out of time, but I want to, you know, give the space for uh, questions or anything, or anybody wants to stay and ask a question. I'll stop sharing now. So I see. Yeah, Janice. Um, how do we access the um, the handouts or the, the I look, you know, I'm, this is being recorded. It takes about, I don't know, anywhere from 20 minutes to a half an hour for the recording to convert itself to something usable. I will put it up on YouTube. And I will put it in my um, in Google Drive. I will send you a letter that has the link to the video on YouTube, which is private. And the only people who have the link can see it right now. Um, I will send you a link to the Google Drive, which will have the chat box, and it will have the recording, and it will have an audio. Um, and the slides will be in the Google Drive, but also on the email, attached to the email, will be a copy of all the slides. Okay, that you'll get you'll get that it's 1130 now. I would expect you probably have that by two o'clock. My time, Pacific time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Sheila, you got a question? Unmute yourself, Sheila and Helena. I'll answer your question too. Can you hear me? Am I okay? Yeah, okay. All right. I have a question about the immune system. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you say have said uh, we want to settle the immune system down, and then sometime you have used the expression. This is an immune booster. So yeah. I'm a little confused. One Thank you. Um, up and the other energy down. No. Immune, system, immune system booster means making it strong, which means it's in a settled place and in its appropriate relationship to the rest of the body. So we don't want a weakened immune system. So people who have a weakened immune system, for example, are people with HIV, Lyme disease, cancers, those systems are weakened already. So we wanna really help the immune system get stronger by optimal breathing that's optimal, optimal oxygenation for energy so that it can hopefully support a stronger constitution. Now there are over, over, overreactive immune system is mostly when you're in a fight and flight and fear response and the body is triggered into something that it's just going after everything. You know, it becomes an autoimmune disease. The thing that's important to think about with the immune system or any of this is that there really is no it really is no separate immune system. Our own body, our, you know, we 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 refer to it in the white blood cells as part of the immune system and things like that. But our whole body is really geared for immunity, um, and so all things that go on in our body are having an impact into how we deal with the outside environment. There's no separate. So I don't believe in the reductionist idea of science that there's this and there's that. It's all working as one complete whole. So when you say um, settle the immune system down, that's no different really than a strong immune system. I mean, well, it's settling it down from over from overreacting through anxiety and fear and um, mm -hmm. panic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's settling it down from that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Helena? Uh, so can you talk a little bit, unless someone else has a question, about uh, if we want to pursue this further, what offerings do you make? Uh, you yeah, I do, private, I do private sessions. I can do one-time private sessions if you have very specific questions. Mm -hmm. Or I teach the Bateco breathing method, which, is a, which is, um, takes you through exercises practices the science of breathing with a little bit more detail and that program is a series of uh, five classes or eight hours um, if maybe if it takes sometimes when I teach them in a class with 20, 10 or 20 people then it takes about an hour and a half when I teach them privately then it takes about an hour in some cases in which case I still offer the eight hours even if it takes six sessions or seven sessions so that I'm walking you through the rehabilitation of your respiratory system and your body um, 
and and measurable so that we we, we have we have standards of measurement that tell us that you're improving in your system and if you do the eight hours do you have to do them like consecutively or can you accommodate them to your work schedule if they're on a one-on-one -on -one business um i yes that's why i really actually like working uh, you know sometimes i used if there was a classes there five days in a row but when i work privately i actually work according to uh, our schedules i think that usually what i think is most effective is to doing the first one and two within a week because once i teach it to you i want to come back on the second one to make sure you're doing it properly once i have a really good sense that you've got the method under hand then we can space them out a week or two weeks while you practice there's homework and so you have to, you know, the improvement comes from doing the homework. So how do you know whether you need the one session or the eight session? Well, it depends on your desire for what you want. Like I'm working with a man in Mexico City who just wanted some information about how to deal with shortness of breath. So we, we worked with one session with that and he's trying out what he needs to do. Um, you know that person. Um, yeah. And he's using some of his other skills. Um, so that's usually what happens. Somebody, but somebody who comes to me and says, I need a complete rehabilitation. I've got asthma and I want these symptoms to go away. I've got COPD. I've got chronic anxiety. And then we need to work over time. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. very, it's very informative. I learned a lot and I appreciate it. Good. And, um, you know, I posted some of the, yes, I see you, Bill. I posted some of these, uh, some of the previous ones online on the Breathable Body YouTube page and some on my Robert Lippman YouTube page, so you can watch some of the older ones. I'm just updating them all the time with new information. So, Bill, you got a question? Yes, I do. Uh, thank you for this, Robert. Uh, are there any adjustments uh, in any of these practices that you would suggest for those of us living at high altitude? How long have you lived at high altitude? Lived at high altitude. Uh, 38 years at just under 9,000 feet. You're adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> I should hope. <laughs> You're adjusted. What happens at high altitude is the body increases its production of red blood cells. And yeah, so, yeah. And so you can carry more oxygen because there's less oxygen up there. Yeah. So I don't think there's any adjustment other than that that you need to make, though, though it's not my expertise, so... Um, yeah. Yeah. Where do you live at 9,000 feet? Uh, Telluride, Colorado. Telluride. Okay. Right. All right. Anything else? Happy to answer. Uh, Robert, I have a question. Wait a minute. Peggy, I think, is wanting to speak, but let me unmute well, I you, say, Peggy. I have, done the, I have done the Bluteco breathing, and I'm an asthmatic, and I just found it so incredibly healthy. I just kind of like, like to give a testament to that. Working with Robin really, really helped me so much. And uh, so if anyone's thinking of doing that, I would highly recommend it. Thank you, Peggy. Yeah, it's really good for asthma and COPD and emphysema, anxiety, and also sleep apnea and latency problems. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Peggy. Was there anything with somebody else? Yeah. Yeah, um, Allison, thank you. Yeah. Um, you know, I lived at high altitude, uh, 9,100 feet, and I ended up developing an issue with that. Um, and I had to go on, it was making my sleep horrible. My oxygen was dropping down to like 84. Mm. Um, and I went on an oxygen concentrator for a year. We sold our house, we live at sea level now. But in hindsight, I found out after moving here that um, I have mold susceptibility and I think I had a real backlog of mold and we cleaned the house out. There was mold in the bathroom, which was yards away from me. <laughs> so I'm wondering if you could speak to mold and, and breathing. I mean, I've been going through a detox of mold. You know, it's just kind yeah, well, of molds get in the lungs and that's really where it's difficult. I mean, it, it's taking up space in the lungs and, des and deteriorating the... Um, ability to, to breathe um, in its effect in the, and some moles can, can be healed out of the lungs and some actually can't, then they stay there for a long time. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, you're, you're highly susceptible. Some people are not susceptible, other people are susceptible to them. And so it really, the, um, from a Bateco viewpoint, you know, it's really amazing to me that um, I've been teaching Bateco since 2003 
and to see what's happening in COVID and to go, he was so right on so long ago that everything he taught is really coming, you know, doctors all of a sudden say proning. Well, Dr. Bateko has been saying that since the 80s, right? And all these other, other these principles are really coming to, to be you know, mm. what's really important. So any disturbance, actually, breathing is so accommodating. There really, really is no right or wrong breathing. So if something's in your lungs and you're breathing in a difficult, difficult way, that's trying to do the best job it can to accommodate the stress that's in there, um, like the shortness of breath. There are signals. And so... Um, learning how again to say, okay, I see what's going on, and it's dysregulating me. How do I? How do I? How do I find out <coughs> behaviors that are causing the dysregulations or the stimulus that are causing dysregulations? And if it's emotional, changing my th thoughts and beliefs to having something that feels more supportive of my uh, breathing, or if it's <coughs> from the external, how do I take care of that? <coughs> like I said, like uh, Sheila asked the question earlier when my breathing is healthy and my immune system is really working in an optimal way, then I'm less susceptible to those things like allergies for one allergies are just right before it's like snoring is before sleep apnea allergies are before asthma. So if I can, if I can see that the allergies are causing me a problem and learn how to, how to strengthen my immune system to not be so reactive to the allergens, then I, then I don't progress to the next stage. And so allergies have become less susceptible to allergies as well. So he used to say, or at least from my teaching, that even if you have a hangnail, it's going to, it's going to affect your breathing. Mm, I can believe that. Right. So, you know, and there were big, there, the potato world in Russia specifically is really big on, um, on, on teeth on not having uh, any root canals or not having any, you know, any, anything, anything foreign in the teeth that they saw a lot of disrupted breathing patterns from stuff that was in the teeth. And the thing that's also really important to note here in the potato world is when you start to, and Janice appointed this to this question before we started, um, is that when you start to breathe well, things that have been suppressed start to come back to the surface because there's this support, this health support that says, well, this has been suppressed for a long time. Let me bring it up to the surface. So sometimes there's clearing reactions like old illnesses that come to the surface that say, oh my God, I'm experiencing those symptoms again. again. But it's like a homeopathic idea. It's kind of, kind of come up to be expressed so it can leave the body because the suppression has, is, a, is a holding and that holding limits the breathing space. And so when your spin breathing space is limited, you're going to overbreathe because you can't get enough. You're going to try to breathe faster. So the suppression, whether it's emotional or physical, wants to come up and free the body to be in complete freedom of movement and breathing so that it doesn't have to work so hard and can really nourish and feed. And that's what Bateko was after. And the key to that is relaxation, is that the more that we can settle the body, and that's why I do that particular exercise of where's my support? Can I rest in support? Can I know that how the support's there and all of a sudden go, wait a minute, just let me rest here for a moment. And when I rest here for a moment, there's more of a space between the end of one exhale and the beginning of the next inhale. And so I'm really basically, what I'm, Babe Teiko is trying to do is not to necessarily teach you a new technique of breathing, but to return you to allowing breathing to be in its natural state. And then when it's in its natural state, it will balance itself out. It's the dysregulated and the, and the adaptations that cause the disruption in the chemistry that then causes symptoms. And, and symptoms like you know, disease, but also symptoms like I feel anxious when I'm you know, talking to somebody or, you know, every time I go to play basketball, I'm short of breath or symptoms like that that show up. Breathing can't accommodate the change in behavior. In behavior. It's, it's so limited in its capacity well, to feed in all I, circumstances. I had yeah. one question. Uh, when I was reading over the Buteco, uh information the other night, uh, one of the things you said, this is more specifically related to asthmatics. You said that people who are asthmatic definitely have different, a little different way. Uh, in other words, they have, they make more mucus. The um, muscles, oops, the muscles. It's all right, are, Peggy, you don't need to come online. I can, I can hear you. Yeah, wait, wait. The, the thing, the thing uh, that, yeah, I'll yeah, answer that. What I was that. asking was, do you think that the breathing 
uh, there's a way of reversing some of those things. Well, it depends. Some people yeah. you know, hereditarily are born with uh, more yeah. mast cells and mast cells produce histamine. So there's more of a histamine reaction. Yeah, that's what I think. I think, yeah, and I'm, somebody, I'm one of those people, people yeah. I'm and also people, one of those people that have early, early, you know, early asthmatic thing, like when I was two years old, so. Yes, and, yeah. and because of the constant stress in the breathing, your smooth muscle around the airways, right. like any muscle, has overworked. And so there's uh -huh. more abundant smooth muscles. So when you are having asthma, that smooth muscle contracts right down and it becomes really severe right there. You can't right, see that. Right, so, right. so carbon dioxide it dilates smooth muscle. And the other thing I think you're referring to, Peggy, everybody's symptoms are different and what triggers exactly. is different. And what, you know, I grew up as an asthmatic and my father did what every other father did at the time. It's all in your head. I'm 76 oh. years old. So back then, it was as if you just straighten your emotions out, you'll be fine. Meanwhile, I can't breathe. But on the uh, other hand, he didn't take me to the doctor either. Um, so I never actually went on medications. But over the time uh -huh. period, medications actually can, can have a, 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 a negative effect on the structure yeah, of the yeah. airways over time. And that's good from, from so many years of medication. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's another hope. Yeah, because I was, as a child, the thing that really helped me, luckily I was able to use this inhaler, which at the time was called vapinephrine. Uh-huh. And that really, I would wake up in the night unable to breathe and that would help me, you know. Yeah, that's what's, in, think, in, the, that's what's in the inhalers now. It's, a, it's an adrenaline in the inhalers, which, you know, speed up the breathing, but yet open the airways. Okay, well, thank you, thank you. And we can get all this information because I'm going to need to be reminded and they'll all be on your website, right? Yeah, and you'll get a recording of this. So you could watch the recording cool. again. Wonderful. Thanks, Peggy. Thank yes, you yeah. again. You're welcome, Peggy. Thanks for coming. Are Dennis? you going to do this? Are you going to do this every week? I'll probably do one next week during the week. I'm teaching a weekend class online for something else next week, but I okay. probably will do it in two weeks, but I'll also do one during this week, probably on a Thursday. Okay. Uh, or Friday noon. Or noon. Okay, I might want to do it again. I just think it's wonderful. Okay. Good reminder. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, Peggy. Thanks to see you. Bye. Uh, Janice? Uh, yeah, just a quick question. Um, I would not be able to afford your one on one, but I wanted to know about your book. Like in the book, uh, The Breathable Body, do you have a lot of this? I don't have a, I don't have a book. The Breathable Body, but I do have, you know, you can go on the YouTube the Breathable Body channel. I have a 35 minute video there on the relationship between breathing and anxiety. Yeah, I've seen which that. I, what I, which I list there. And there are some good books out there. Um, you know, Patrick McEwen has a book called uh, Close Your Mouth. Um, and you can go online. There's a lot of teachings online for it. Mm -hmm. um, but also I do want to mention that there is um, on that slide is a, is a resource for holistic orthopedics. And holistic orthopedics is an orthopedic um, practitioners in North Seattle. And we've combined um, our efforts and now with, with um, the virus, everything's online. So I'm part of their staff for telemedicine and she'll bill through, she'll bill through insurance. So insurance can pay for the for the lessons. So if you can you can get a hold of orthopedics, and if you have insurance, they can find out whether your insurance will cover um, their their codes, and then you can get the breathing with insurance paying for it. Medica and Medicare. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. you, orthopedic orthopedic the, the, the link there. If you're getting the slides. You can just or you just look up holistic. Um, orthopedics um, and you call them and tell them what church you have and they'll let you know what it has and then you can schedule an appointment. Okay, thank Social you. Medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hi Robert. Hi Patricia. I just, uh, I need to go so I just wanted to thank you. It was um, great hearing you again about all this and a uh, little repetition yeah, and um, I might contact you by mail. Okay, about great. some more specific things. Okay, great. Okay. Nice to see you. Good to see you again. Take care. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you, everybody. All right. All right, any other thoughts or questions? Yeah, Katie? Hold on, Katie. Got to unmute you. Go ahead. Hey, uh, Carl, um, 
the the Dr. Breathe Breathe and who Breath, um yeah. yeah he um discovered the holes in the diaphragm mm -hmm. with emphysemics and um and he focused on strengthening the diaphragm with the breathing exercises. Did he demonstrate that the holes would heal? Oh, absolutely. I, there are some videos that I I don't I, they were on on whatever the video was, videotape for a while. I had them, I don't know, I didn't convert them over. You may be able to find them online now, but he, he definitely showed pictures of emphysemics who came in who were like stick thin. And he worked with them over time and he shows them working with them and he shows the, the, the pictures, the videos of the diaphragms and how they walk out, you know, just full and plump and breathing well and breathing in the right way without their shoulders way up here. And, yeah, he had a lot of success. Actually, he was hired by, if I get the story correct, he was hired by the U.S. Navy to validate their uh, their breathing evaluation machines. And what he basically showed was the machines were wrong. They weren't they weren't doing anything to help people with emphysema. They were just you know just measuring wrong kinds of information that he thought was wrong, not the strength of the diaphragm and their ability to breathe. So that so that he. Either Navy let him go, or he just said, "I'm not working for you because you're not going in the right direction." So he be, became really famous for that, and he really did a beautiful job in the 19. I mean, I like to tell the story. We're just hanging out here. I like to tell the story about he was one of the major characters in the link of uh, us having a uh, Obama as president. Uh, it's a funny kind of thing that breathing had an influence in that because. He went to the Olympics in 1968 to train the U.S. track team because they were worried about the altitude in Mexico City. So he trained them with this method and had to really breathe from the back of those lungs, way down deep from the back of the lungs. And the, the, two, the two black athletes that won first and third and raised their hands in black power uh, got up on that mantle because they knew how to breathe. And so if you look at the history of, you know, of, Black history, and you know that was an infinite, that was a very integral part in raising awareness of the issue of racism in this country, and so it's part it's part of the link through through the history of Black history, and it had to do with breathing. So wow. I just love that story myself. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very inspired. Very inspired. Beautiful talk. Yeah. Lots good. of good well, information. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. So we're done, Helena. Let me know what you want to do in the future. Just give me, drop me an email, and um, yeah, I'll be on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, I can't. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank. Yes. Yeah, thank you very. Thank much. you very much, Mark. You're welcome, everybody. Thank you for showing up. <clears throat> I appreciate it. All right. Take thank you. Take good care. Thank I'll send you a recording soon. Bye bye. Okay.